So what are we actually doing um, the, in the security profile? We're, we're defining a logical architecture that actually maps to the different components of the system. Um, we'll take that abstract logical architecture and map it up against real world components and say, okay, if you're producing a device, you know, that is commonly known as X, here's how we treat it in our security profile. Um, we actually make recommendations in terms of how we say you should segment your networks in terms of uh, protecting different portions of the network, what functions and, and what capabilities uh, should go in, in what orientation uh, to, provide, to provide an op optimal security posture. Um, we go through a, a pretty rigorous set of use cases where we actually define the functionality that, uh, that we are uh, developing security controls for. Um, and that's currently uh, represented in a set of 16 use cases. Um, these use cases uh, actually are pretty explicitly defined down to the individual step level. Um, such, I'll say the, the step here, step five in this case is local phaser gateway forwards PMU data to all remote phaser gateways with an established data stream for that PMU's data. So it's, it gets pretty, gets pretty detailed. They get pretty, they can range across the spectrum pretty, uh, pretty complex, um, down to pretty simple. Um, and you put the, piece these things together to figure out, okay, what functionality is it that you're addressing? And we, then we actually bind security controls um, to, those individual, to those individual things. Um, and recognizing that I'm probably way over my time here, I'm gonna skip taking you through some of the security controls, but that at least um, identifies some of the scope of what we're trying to address and how we're trying to go about doing it. I think. Um, I also would like to add to this, uh, to both comments, is that synchro phasers uh, is also used to identify PMUs, and they are used as a checkable uh, phaser uh, measurement unit. And, and also, a, as you see in the application that was shown there, how fast the information comes in, and uh, it's between, you know, 30 samples uh, per second. And the phasers are not, the phaser function is not new per se. Uh, it's been around late, late 90s, early 2000s. It has been embedded in other IED devices, intelligent electronic devices, um, protective relays, and so forth. It, 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 it was not until uh, the Black Ops 2003 that uh, the industry and experts woke up and said, well, we need to, to address this. We need to, to be able to see in a faster manner uh, uh, you know, the, the, big, the big elephant coming. Um, so it, it was uh, at that point that the uh, industry and the government per se identifies and creates a key element on, on a grid. And the government per se is because through their grants, they have been able to uh, assist in deployments uh, throughout. PGM also is working on deploying uh, 90 uh, PMUs on our um, area. The, the, the architecture basically covers, you know, PMU, PDC, on uh, a substation PDC at the uh, uh, utility. Uh, as on RTO, we had another layer, uh, which is a super PDC, uh, where we receive information from all the transmission operators. Um, and as Darren was mentioning, the delay is huge. Uh, and we introduced another one by the RTO. So uh, yeah, be very careful as introduced. Thank you. Um, we'll start questions here in just a couple of minutes. I've got, I think the, our panelists have covered most of the ones on our list. Uh, I've got one I think I'll start. Um, and we were having a discussion with some of the other utility folks here um, earlier this morning talking about the concept of, you know, as we evolve with, you know, technology. And, and I think in some respects we can look at this as kind of a micro version of what happened with the internet. I mean, nobody could conceive what we were gonna be doing with the internet when it was first created, but it's an ideal case of you stick something out there and people are gonna dream up things beyond what you've imagined. So, um, you know, one of the short-term evolutions in, you know, the utilities is the economies of scale looking at, you know, reducing the hardware footprint. I know in the early generations, the PMU, the measurement device, was really a separate 
physical device in the substation. And we're seeing now utilities have that choice of I can continue that mode or I can really start embedding it into hardware that's already out there that's capable of doing these functions. So, uh, but that gives them then a kind of a, a you know, an issue they've got to now wrestle with their conscience because, um, you know, if we embed this function in a protection relay, um, how do you see the pros and cons of that debate going forward? Because it's really a, it's a spirited debate and you can find yourself arguing each side of the coin, especially, you know, since we know we're in the bulk electricity electric environment, we know NERC SIP is directly in play in all these systems. Now we're talking about adding a remote connect, another remote connection to a potentially, you know, what today's termed a critical cyber asset. So you guys want to give us your kind of rough thoughts on, you know, how do we, how to really address that challenge moving forward, you know, you know, harness the value, but keep ourselves out of painting ourselves into a corner. Yeah, um, I believe it's, it, 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 it turns out to be a business challenge, um, not so much of a technology challenge. Um, as the PMU require more speed, uh, and, and uh, if the protective relay can't provide that, that's one of the things that uh, it can be solved. But where that relay re resides, um, and where the PMU resides, that would count a lot. Um, because as we are aware, as uh, NERCSIP comes into play, we need to be very careful where we place and what part network it is placed on. Uh, most utilities are working on uh, IEEE 61850 uh, substation automation. Um, PMUs are not there yet. Uh, most of the companies are installing outside. So it will be a business decision at the end of the day. Uh, need to think about is the delay that will be introduced uh, if any other uh, security requirements need to be in place. But um, makes, in technology speaking, it makes no difference if it is uh, an isolated device or is embedded on uh, other functionality. So um, I'll, I'll actually speak wearing the, wearing the SCE hat uh, explicitly for a minute and talk about some of what um, SCE is looking at doing with, with synchro phasers. Um, while we're not building the phaser measurement functionality into, into relays, we're actually building them into, into digital fault recorders um, in the substations. Um, they're, uh, nonetheless, we are, we are treating them as though they need to meet the NERC CIP requirements. Um, just as uh, kind of as a baseline it's it's actually almost easier that way um, from a technical control standpoint that's it's actually not as big a deal um, really where the burden comes in is in all of the rec record keeping um, and all of the administrative procedures that go along with a NERC CIP critical critical asset or critical cyber asset so um, from from the standpoint of architecting the system, uh, there's not a tremendous difference um, whether, you know, we're going to build that level, we're going to actually going to build a uh, more stringent level of protection into the system than the NARC CIPs require from a technical standpoint anyway. Um, so it's really more of a question, like I said, of, of record keeping. Um, the thing that, that really drives us, even though we're not uh, integrating these, this functionality into, um, into protective relays, um, you might say, well, you know, a digital fault recorder, that sounds pretty much like a read-only device. Why are you so worried about it? Even if it was on a separate network, um, which it's probably not, it's probably on the same network, but um, we are actually looking at, um, at using the, um, I don't know, maybe decade down the road uh, scenario of using this to feed into high speed, wide area, uh, wide area control, wide area protection. Um, so basically, um, you know, if you're familiar with the Western grid at all, um, we've got a lot of things called uh, remedial action schemes um, that get extremely complicated in trying to structure, you know, okay, what happens if this asset, uh, you know, if we lose one particular asset or another asset, and it winds up being a very complicated set of spreadsheets very quickly, especially when you start thinking about more than one remedial action scheme and the overlaps. 
Um, so there is the concept that we might, uh, that we would like to eventually build um, something like a centralized remedial action scheme or CRAS um, that incorporates all of these, uh, all of these different parameters um, into, you know, essentially one uh, control system that is truly, it's, it treats the entire grid like we currently treat the substation. Yeah, Brian, I, I tend to agree with my colleagues. Uh, from my personal experience, it seems like there's nothing technically wrong with taking a device that's already measuring your same you know, your CTs and PTs out in the field and turning that into a device that can measure phasers because technically they already are. Uh, really, if it has a, a network connection and a GPS, uh, a way to get the GPS signal, there's nothing technically, there is no technical issue. It's more of a business kind of problem. It's business both from who managed this particular device plus what you're saying, the paperwork involved with it. Uh, you know, there's lots of teams of people that are, that are set out to deal with light protective relays because it's such a critical function. And, you know, to them, they're dealing with this device day in and day out and they may not want the extra burden or having to share necessarily with a whole other set of people that are dealing with this device or communications relay. So in those kind of scenarios where you have those kind of groups that are uh, segregated already, sometimes it makes perfect sense to have another device, perhaps like the digital fault recorders, which are maybe a little less stringent, a uh, little, you know, little less requirements involved with getting extra functionality set up on those devices, or a lot of companies setting up just putting a whole other device altogether in there so it can be managed independently. So all those scenarios uh, are in play and just depending on either the the business complexities of the or the business units and the way they're organized inside the company they're making those kind of decisions but in the end the the answer is the same the devices are being deployed or they're reutilizing the existing device to provide that functionality okay thank you we got any questions from the audience at this point I have one. And uh, you can answer this uh, in any way you feel comfortable answering this. I sort of get, when we're talking about things like AMI and substations, I get one of the bad things that can happen from a security perspective, right? AMI, you know, remote disconnect on a bunch of meters, potentially, right? Denial of service path, potentially. Um, you know, accessing information they can't access, or with substations, something like you know, or generation you know, stocks that or whatever. I know from a security perspective, you're saying, well, we want to be able to make sure that we can get this information when we need it. But potentially, what can a bad guy do to a synchrophaser to actually cause a big problem that you say, whoa, we never really thought that could happen? Or, and I know, you know, working for a utility can't be in, in a lot of people, but give us an idea, a sense of, you know, what are some of the critical things we need to really look out for. Okay, so no, I'll, I'll actually be uh, very frank here, um, even, wearing, even wearing the utility hat, because I think that's, that's what's, that's what's going to be needed for us to engineer the adequate level of security in, into these systems. Um, but to answer the, the question really depends a tremendous amount on, on how you're actually using the data. Um, if, uh, and this comes down to actually the, the NASPY data classes. Um, if you're uh, class E data, that's actually just uh, doing research after the fact. Um, so class, class D is where you're using it for, um, for analysis, um, but you know, like within the utility, um, basically trying to do fault analysis or, or uh, figure out what happened uh, on, a, on a certain event. Um, you can also class C is where you start to feed it into um, feed it into visualization applications. So you've got operators, system operators, that are looking real time at real time results of what these phaser measurements are, are displaying. Um, but that's the extent of where the connection is is the is the in the mental connection of the operator seeing what's going on on the grid versus the the actions that they choose to take. Um, class B is where you start feeding it into things like state estimators. So it still may not be taking an actual action, but you're much more deeply integrating the data and the readings into 
um, all of the readings that the, that the operator is seeing. It's not just the operator looking at the synchrophaser panel over here and saying, oh, that looks kind of flaky, and then saying, okay, the rest of my systems look pretty good, I'm, I'm all right. We're talking about the data getting integrated into every one of their screens. And of course, class A being, okay, now you're actually doing, you're taking physical action on the grid as a result of, of, this, of this data. So you might actually have uh, a piece of code that decides, okay, that's a little too close to the edge and I think I'm gonna open a breaker. Um, so you, you've actually got um, some physical consequences at, at that level. I'm gonna completely skip over the question of, okay, well, I've hacked into the synchrophaser system, where can I go from here? That's also a legitimate one. But when you're talking specifically about compromise of the PMU data itself and what kind of impact it can have, um, it really boils down to, uh, to how you're using the system. 